And now, a dramatic reading by Professor Victor. Father wears his Sunday best. Mother's tired. She needs a rest. The kids are playing up. Downstairs. Sister's sighing in her sleep. Ah. Brother's got a date to keep. He can't hang around. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Horror Movie Syllabus. My name is Professor Victor, and I'll be your host as we go through all the essential, noteworthy, interesting, and notorious modern horror films. If you're new to the channel, I recommend you check out our introduction video. There's a link to that in the description below, and it'll give you a pretty good idea of what the horror movie syllabus is all about. Basically, we look at a particular subgenre of horror, and then we pick three movies from that subject to explore. But this is our doctorate level selection. In this video, we're going to revisit a subgenre that we've already talked about uh, and recap that video, to, to go over the movies that we picked, and then pick a fourth doctorate level selection, something a little bit more lesser known, a uh, deeper cut, if you will, for the subgenre. And this is going to be a fun one because we're going to go revisiting the madness subgenre. And the madness subgenre is one that we talked about is a little bit of a vague subgenre because so many different kinds of horror movies involve some sort of aspect of madness in one way or another, some sort of mental health issue or craziness or whatever. And there's a lot of overlap between madness and, and all these other subgenres. So we focused the madness subgenre on movies where the central character or the central plot of the story had to do with madness, had to do with a mental health issue or something like that. And we also talked about how, not for nothing, the the mental health uh, uh, is not a um, well-treated uh, aspect or plot point in horror movies in general. Horror movies are not kind to mental health. They are pretty, you know, not not great, uh, especially by today's standards. We know better. And so that's a lot of uh, what causes some of the uncomfortableness when we look at some of these movies. But by and large, we were able to focus on some movies that deal with madness that were classics, really good, and did a good job of portraying something that felt if not completely accurate, at least not terribly offensive. At least that's my opinion. Your, my, yours might vary. But we're going to go ahead and recap the ones that we talked about right now. The first horror movie about madness that we discussed was Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. And the first thing that we had to talk about was that we were breaking our rule regarding regarding modern horror films because we generally use the cutoff as 1970, 1970 to the present. And, you know, 1960 is when Psycho came out. So we had to talk about why we were breaking the rule. And it was because it's such an important classic movie that had such an influence on horror going forward. It's one of Alfred Hitchcock's best movies. It shows a lot of his innovation, his directing style, a lot of the things that he would become famous for in terms of tension and twists and surprise. And it's arguably the birth of the slasher movie. We talked about that quite a bit in the video. We also talked about how by today's sensibilities, it might feel a little bit slow. It might feel like it's not as fast paced as what a modern audience is used to, but it still holds up really well as an entertaining movie. And it's spawned a franchise that is by and large really, really great with a lot of underrated sequels and a great television show that we've talked about too. So Psycho had to be discussed on the channel. The next madness movie that we talked about was The Shining. And The Shining is yet another massively important classic movie that we talked about. And there was a lot of different subgenres I could have put it under. We talked about this and how we decided to go with Madness because it's such a central part of why the movie is so memorable. Specifically, Jack Nicholson's performance of a man slipping into madness and just how intense and you know iconic that that performance is we talked a lot about stanley kubrick and his attention to detail and his skill as a director and how these things have led to a lot of obsessive theories about the hidden meanings of the movie so much so that there was even a documentary about it which we've also talked about on the channel and we looked at all of those different theories and all of the impressions and, and impact that the movie had and especially the impact it had on me because i saw this as a child and i told the story about seeing this movie when i was way too young to see it so if you're interested in hearing that story go check the original video out but Shining is one that you knew was going to go on the, onto the channel somewhere and this is where we decided to put it. And the last Madness movie that we talked about was Black Swan. 
And we talked about the mainstream success that Black Swan had, both commercially and critically. It was loved by the critics, and it even was nominated for a lot of Academy Awards and even won the Academy Award for Natalie Portman's performance in it, which was deserved because she was incredible in the movie. We talked about Darren Aronofsky, the director, and how he put together this really wonderfully creepy uh, series of images and this idea of an unreliable narrator and really captured the idea of what it must be like to go mad. We also delved into how you know snobs would call this movie a thriller instead of a horror movie because of the accolades, because of the critical respect it got, because of its mainstream appeal. They didn't really want to give it its horror bona fides. And you know how I feel about that. So we went into that quite a bit. We also talked about Perfect Blue because I know there's those of you out there, and I'm one of them, that acknowledges this movie kind of ripped off Perfect Blue, which we've also talked about on the channel. Uh, if you want to get more into that, go and check out the video, uh, the Madness video, and also check out our horror animated, animated horror video because we talk a lot about Perfect Blue. It's worth hearing about. It's really interesting stuff. But Black Swan, it's a, it's a great Madness horror movie. It had to be talked about. So those are the movies we selected for the Madness subgenre, and now it's time to see what we selected for the Doctorate level selection. Our doctorate level selection for the Madness subgenre is Pin. Pin came out in 1988 and is a movie directed by Sander Stern, who is a apparently a big horror director, uh, does a lot of horror movies on his resume, but I'm not super familiar with his work, but he's doing really good work here. This is an interesting movie that is kind of underrated or unknown, doesn't seem to get as much praise as it should, and that went a long way towards why I decided to pick it for our doctorate level selection, because I definitely feel like this is one that deserves a little bit more of a spotlight on it, deserves a little bit more attention, a little bit more love. Now, if you haven't seen it before, like most of you probably haven't, the movie is about a young man who is mentally ill, and his father is a doctor who's also a ventriloquist, and uses his ventriloquism powers to make the boy think that he is having a conversation with his dad's medical dummy that is used to show anatomy, etc., and he finds the the dummy to be his only friend and he grows up believing that this dummy is real and basically having you know essentially a kind of schizophrenic type uh reality uh problems and as the movie goes on pin the name of the dummy starts giving him advice that maybe isn't always great and hijinks abound i want to stop there so it's not spoil the movie too much because it is definitely one that if you haven't seen i would recommend now, it's worth noting, the movie's a little bit of a slow burn. It is not a gory movie. It's not a, what I'd call psychological horror, exactly, but it isn't a gory movie. It's more of a tension movie. It's got the thriller going on. It's not what I'd call a thriller. Again, I, I like to call things horror movies when they're horror movies. But the movie's premise is rife with tension and a little bit of sadness and a little bit of frustration as well. You've got this boy who believes that this medical dummy is real. And his dad knows it, and in particular his sister knows it. And nobody really does anything about this. Nobody goes, you know, maybe we should have this boy talk to somebody. Maybe there's something wrong here. Nobody wants to tell the boy that the doll's not real. Nobody wants to make him face reality. And that's kind of infuriating. It's an infuriating part of the movie. And you kind of have to roll with it if you're going to enjoy the movie. Because it's so prevalent in the movie. But it also is worth doing because the movie is interesting. Now, I mentioned Sander Stern as the director, and he's, again, not, not somebody I'm familiar with his work, really, but I've probably seen some of it because there's a lot of it, but before he was a, uh, a director, he was a medical doctor, and I think that helped him in making this movie because he seemed to have a good idea of how to film the doctor and how the doctor has this compassion uh, when he's being a doctor, but doesn't seem to know how to communicate with his kids or be kind or open or warm outside of it. And it's very, very effective. And it's Terry O'Quinn playing the doctor, which just adds another layer to it because we all know Terry O'Quinn is awesome. He does great work and he's doing great work here. And actually, frankly, the whole cast is doing great work. They're all solid. The kid actors are good when they're a little bit older and they're like in their late teens, early 20s. They're very good. They're really solid actors here. And then you've got the dummy pin who's suitably creepy. They do a really good job of taking what you know is an inanimate object and making you start to question it and making you a little creeped out by it and doing some pretty fun, creepy scenes with it that I thought were very effective. Uh, in fact, you know, Pin, does Pin kill people in this movie? Well, that's a matter of debate. That's a matter of perspective. I'm not going to spoil any of that for you, but it's an interesting thing where you can make an argument that Pin is a killer. I don't, again, I don't want to get into it too much because I don't want to spoil things, but it's really fun 
to see this movie work out the way it works out. Uh, and I guess it's, it's adapted from a book uh, of the same name by a guy named Andrew Niederman. I don't know him. I've never read the book. Uh, apparently he is a, a pretty well-known author. I think he did some like uh, ghost writing for V.C. Andrews or something. I don't know. I, I didn't get too deep into the weeds on the author of it, but he and Sandra Stern worked together uh, on adapting the book for the screen. I think they did a pretty good job of it. Like I said, it's a little bit of a slow burn sometimes, but it does offer, A, some really good tension and creeps, and B, really awkward, uncomfortable stuff. And this is the main thing I like about the movie, is that it's really odd and uncomfortable. Like I said, the whole thing about not explaining to the boy that he's mentally ill, uncomfortable, weird. But there's other weird stuff going on here. Like the dad in and of himself is weird. The idea that he does things like give sex talks to his children via pin by using his ventriloquism, that's super weird. Like, it's like the only way you can connect with them is to to talk through pin. Otherwise, he's very cold and kind of a jerk and everything. It's weird and it's uncomfortable. And then there's the whole scene later on. I'm spoiling the movie ever so slightly, but uh, the sister winds up needing an abortion and the dad is going to give her the abortion. The dad, who's a doctor, is going to give his own 15-year-old daughter an abortion and then invites her brother to stay and watch because it'll be educational mind-blowing i was just like what the hell is this and it's it's, it's it's stuff like that in the movie it kind of goes throughout like this weird uh stuff and the way that the sister gets controlled the way that the brother gets further and further detached from reality the way that other people look at the situation and the way people react to stuff is wild unsettling very infuriating in a good way and just a really a wild ride of a movie i really really like pin and it's weird because apparently uh, they didn't have a lot of confidence in it. It went straight to video uh, back in uh, 1988. I think it actually wound up coming out in 89 uh, on video because they just didn't do much of a theatrical release for it, or if any at all, because they just didn't have a lot of confidence in it. They didn't, it wasn't a slasher, really. It didn't have the blood and guts that they'd expect for it. And so they kind of went meh about it, and they just let it that kind of go quietly to, to video. But then it kind of got their cult following there. The critics really liked this movie. The you know cult following loves this movie, and deservedly so. Uh, apparently, uh, and you know... When doing the research, part of what drove the 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 decision to direct a video was that the 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 movie studio, it was a New World Pictures, was kind of going under or whatever. So they didn't have confidence that this movie would be enough of a hit to warrant the money they would spend to make it a theatrical release, uh, and that maybe it was a mistake because it, it seems to have a very positive reputation. If it was marketed properly, I think that people would have really gravitated towards this and it would have been a popular movie. At least I feel like so, like that, like that. But I really like the movie, so maybe I'm a little bit biased. If you've seen it, let me know. Do you think Pen would have been a commercial success? Assuming that it was marketed properly. If it wasn't marketed like a slasher movie or something like that, because people would be disappointed if that was the case. But if it was marketed as something of a kind of a psychological thriller slash messed up family dynamic thing, let me know, because this movie... I don't know. I think it's wild. I think it's a grossly underrated movie that not a lot of people know about. So again, if you've seen it, let me know your thoughts on it. Let me know if you're as into it as I am. And if you haven't seen it, by all means, check out Pin. Pin is a wild ride. Should be seen by more people. That's why we're talking about it here. Check it out and let me know what you think. So that's our doctorate level selection for madness horror movies. But of course, I've got an extra credit selection as well because these movies are great. And I wanted to talk about another one. And the one I'm going to talk about today is called Spider. Spider came out in 2002 and is directed by David Cronenberg and continues my effort to get every Cronenberg movie onto these videos because apparently I just love me some Cronenberg so much that I got to talk about every one of them because this one is admittedly not as much of a horror movie as it is a really disturbing drama, but we're going to talk about it anyways because it's, it's good and it's underrated. So if you haven't seen it before... The movie stars Ray Fiennes as a mentally ill man who's been released from an asylum and is now being moved into a halfway house so he can kind of start getting his, his life back on track. And he's trying to piece together his past. He's having flashbacks and remembering things from his past and trying to kind of make sense of the tangled web of his memories. And in the meantime is starting to lose his grip on his very tenuous grip on reality and slip back into the kind of mental illness that got him institutionalized in the first place. And of course, hijinks abound. But we're going to stop there. So again, just to not spoil the movie for anybody, this movie is probably one of Cronenberg's lesser known movies. It's no fly. It's not Videodrome or Naked Lunch or anything like that. It's one of the lesser known ones, but it's no less good in my opinion. I mean, 
maybe less good. We're talking about some awesome classic movies there, but it's still really, really good. The movie was got a lot of critical acclaim. It was really well received by critics, but didn't really capture the audience that the even some of these bigger Cronenberg hits. But then Cronenberg's already kind of a niche director, and this movie feels niche on top of that. So it's a little bit of a a hard sell for a commercial or mainstream audience, but it did get recognized as being a really good movie, both in terms of the acting, which we'll get to in a minute, and in like the feel or the tone of the movie. It really does have like this kind of creepy, foreboding, like macabre sense of like dread and a little bit of claustrophobia and a little bit of dirtiness. They really nailed it with the 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 aesthetic of the movie, the way it's shot. The, the setting of the movie, everything really comes together to give you this kind of grimy feeling of this, like, like your skin kind of crawling. Uh, it really puts you in, in, in that halfway house with all of these mentally ill people and, 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 and namely Ray Fiennes. The movie's with him pretty much the entire time as he's trying to piece together these memories from his childhood, navigate this halfway house life, and he's really not doing well. Like when we when we meet him, he's not doing well. He's very off putting. He is very unsettling and uncomfortable. And he's walking down the street, and people are kind of like weirded out by him. And you would be too. You're kind of weirded out by him just watching it, even though you do feel a little sorry for him. You also know he's not right right off the bat. And and it really is a masterful performance by Rafe. He's just so good in this because he's. He's writing that line between being caricature and kind of Rain man -y or whatever and, and, and being subtle. He's right on the line of it where he gives you something that is very believable and off-putting and uncomfortable, but also a little bit big, but not too big. It's a great performance. He gets a lot of praise for it and deservedly so. And then his co-star Miranda Richardson is amazing in the movie. She's absolutely great. Unfortunately, can't talk too much about why without spoiling the movie a little bit. So I don't want to talk to you about why she's so good in this movie. You'll just have to take my word for the fact that she really steals scenes and steals the show and gives a fantastic performance in the movie. And if you've seen it, y'all know why I'm saying it like that. But she's great. The acting is top notch. There's no weak links in this. It's just it's mostly they're the main stars of the movie and they're great. And the whole thing really works because it is this slow burn drama. It's kind of slow in the beginning and it picks up as it goes along, but it never gets fast. But it's like this drama that has like these sprinklings of horror in it. It's just, it's mostly just that it gets under your skin. It just is, it's kind of macabre and uh, it makes you feel uncomfortable. And, and that's where the horror comes from. Like the, the, there is some bona fide horror type stuff in there, but it's very, very, very light. I, I want to be very honest and upfront about this. This is barely a horror movie. It's barely a horror movie. It's really a, an off putting drama, but it's a really good one. And it's David Cronenberg. Now, again, full disclosure, you're not really getting body horror here. You're not getting the typical David Cronenberg movie here. And it's not a grand departure. It's not like straight story by David Lynch. It's not like that, but it is different than a lot of what you're used to with seeing like the really super weird stuff from David, David Cronenberg. This is like Cronenberg light. He's rather restrained here and it's a little bit more straightforward, a little less fantastical, a little less gross, a little less strange, uh, a little less strange. It's still a pretty strange movie, but it's definitely one to check out. If you like Cronenberg, well, frankly, you've probably already seen this, but if you haven't, you should check this one out. I do think that it gets neglected or um, kind of skipped over in favor of some of his more well-known and better and and more, you know, spicy, uh, gross and, and no notorious movies. Uh, but this one is one that people are sleeping on. They should really check this one out. If you haven't seen it, definitely check it out. If you like these kind of movies, again, slow burn, but masterful performances, really great. Love this one. And again, I just wanted to bring it to light in case people didn't know about it, because it is definitely one that is worth checking out. So that's our revisiting of the madness subgenre of horror. Uh, these movies tend to be really, really good. And yes, almost everything we talk about could go in another subgenre, but it feels appropriate to put it here because it is focusing on madness, the mental health. And again, sometimes these things aren't really addressed super well in a movie, but the movies themselves tend to be really, really good. So everything we've touched on today, check it out. All of it. Very, very good. And now it's a good time to check out a horror trivia pursuit card. As you know, I like to take a crowd and try to read it on camera, or do read it on camera, and try to answer it on camera, and hopefully get it right without cutting, so you know that I'm not cheating. And since we're talking about madness, we're going to look at the psychological category, because that tracks. Uh, and, and the question is, what is the name of the political party that institutes the annual purge 
in the Purge series from 2013 to 2018. Frankly, I think it goes beyond that. The card's a little old. Uh, so I'm going to be honest with you. I, off the top of my head, I don't know the answer to this question. I don't. I don't. I, I know that they made a you know, note of it. Like they, would, they would talk about it like when you'd see the scroll from the purge, when the purge was about to happen, the, the, you know, the horn was going to go off and the time was coming up. They'd have this scroll and they'd talk about that political party. And I cannot, for the life of me, remember what it is. And, you know, I'm going to have to take a guess. And, you know, you, you want to say the Republican Party, <laughs> you know, but no, no. Uh, you know, whoever is into guns, but, but the, the movie made a big point of this. It's, and then as the movies go on and you get more and more into the political aspect of it, and frankly, the movies get farther and farther away from horror and more and more into like action and stuff like that. The, the political party does become a central focus of the movies, but I'll be damned if I can remember what it was called. You know me, I'm, I'm poor with names a lot of the time. So this one's a little frustrating because I know I know I'm going to hear it. I'm going to be like, ah, oh, yeah, you know, but, but it's not there right now. It's just not there for me. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, again, as usual, prattling to give you guys some thought. And you, you guys might know. So if you're big fans of The Purge, I'm sure you're going to remember this or know it. But if you're not a fan of The Purge, you're going to be in the same boat I am. You're going to be trying to guess. And I'm really not sure. I have in the vaguest back part of my mind, I have an idea of what I want to say. So I'm going to go with that. And, and knowing that I'm probably wrong, but it's the best I got. So there's no real reason for me to sit here and spin my wheels anymore. And hopefully you're done spinning yours. Lock in whatever answer you got because we're about to answer this right now. I'm going to say that it's the new Freedom Party or something like that. I think the word freedom's in there. So I'm going to say new Freedom Party knowing I'm probably wrong. Let's go ahead and see what the card tells me. And the card says it is the new Founding Fathers of America. I do remember that now. Yes, New Founding Fathers. I don't think I would have gotten New Founding Fathers of America, but the New Founding Fathers does come up in that movie a lot. Now that I hear it, I can say I had new, right? <laughs> that wasn't the part I thought I got right. I thought I had freedom, and freedom is nowhere to be found in there. But uh, dang, I, I did not know that one. And I knew it right off the bat that I didn't know that one. So it sucks to be me. Hopefully it doesn't suck to be you. Did you guys get that right? And if not, what did you guess? Did you guess something like me? And is it funny? Let me know in the comments below. I'd like to hear that stuff. Also, let me know if you've got any cool madness movies that uh, you think I should check out that maybe I haven't checked out. Maybe we'll do a video on that in the future. Uh, thank you for hanging out and hopefully you enjoyed this video. Next week we're doing something completely different. But until then, class dismissed.